Let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. Good morning, church. Good morning to everyone joining us on live stream. As we gather to worship together, open your hearts to a message of hope and grace. We are renewed by the Holy Spirit, and no matter what we have been through, God restores us to joy as we celebrate this new day. I pray that what you hear today is God loves you, and so do we. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Jesus offers restoration to all, transforming us. Jesus gives us new life so that we may grow and thrive. Jesus gives us new life in the here and now. Let us embrace the new life Jesus offers and celebrate the joy of being fully known and fully loved for who we are. Please remain, please remain standing as we sing our praises to God. Good morning, church. Good morning. Our opening song today is Your Grace is Enough. I pray you sing with us.
us in your love. Thank you, God, for grace. And now we pray together. Please be seated. Awesome and transformative God, disrupt our daily routines, break through our barriers, and shake us awake to new possibilities. Move us beyond fear to faith. Breathe new life into these old bones that we may come alive for you. Shatter our assumptions and fill us with the joy of abundant life offered to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Church, once again, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this morning, the choir is coming to you uh, with a song that simply says, Prayer Still Works. Does anybody believe that prayer still works? Yes. Today, we're going to hear about the miracles that God still works the amazing awesomeness of God's grace. And I invite you to sing the lines of these, this simple song. The choir is back. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Prayer still works, because some of you were praying for the choir to come back. And so we're back, and I invite you to just join and sing as the lyrics are on the screen. Some of them said, I've been singing every week. Some of them said, I'm pretty good in the shower. Somebody else said, I haven't sang in a choir since Nixon was in the White House. But you know what? <laughs> We're here to just testify of God's goodness and God's amazing power and the power of prayer.
thankful for us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad that you're joining us for worship today. Uh, if you hear anything, know that God loves you, and so do we. I'm so glad that you're joining us uh, for worship today. Those of you joining us online, good morning. We're so glad that you are with us, wherever you are. I just want to uh, uh, just uh, point out to you a couple things. Uh, first of all, I, always, I want to make sure I don't forget to do this. Uh, if you are new here, I invite you to fill out the I'm New Here card, the blue cards that look like this. Just put your name, one way to contact you, and we would love to reach out to you for you to get to know us, for us to get to know you as well. So please, if you are new or it's been a while, uh, please fill out the blue cards and put it in the offering plate, and we would love to reach out to you. Also, if you haven't done so already, now's a great time to please fill out those red fellowship pads. They look like this, and each of the pews, just write your name and pass it down, and we know that you're here. I know that Juana especially would really, really appreciate it if you fill those out. Right, Juana? Amen. Uh, yeah, it makes her job a little easier, so please go ahead and do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to share a few announcements this morning. So this weekend, this coming Friday, is the Ignite Youth Conference. And the theme is Limitless. A couple hundred, maybe even a thousand uh, youth students across New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania will be attending the youth uh, conference. Hello. So you want to say hi to everyone? Say hi. Okay. Say hi. All right. You want to go back to mommy now? Okay. All right. Go. Watch your step. All righty. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, the Ignite Conference is, again, this weekend, Friday. We're leaving at 5 p.m. from church. And uh, this is a time, I just love this conference. This is a time where hundreds, maybe even a thousand or more youth students gather together. We have uh, powerful music, great messages, uh, great activities and opportunities to encounter the love of Jesus Christ in community. I remember I was just seeing lives transformed as they attend this, uh, uh, this gathering. And so it hasn't happened in three years. The last gathering was 2019 uh, due to the pandemic. We've been taking, they've been taking a break, but we're coming back. And we're so excited uh, for this conference. Uh, Michelle and I are uh, going to be taking some of our students down to Wildwood. And uh, I want to make sure that you all are aware that this is happening because I want to invite all of you to pray for us. Pray that our students would encounter Christ. Pray that our students would encounter the power of the Holy Spirit and that they would be filled with love, God's love and God's joy and that it would be a, one of those um, uh, moments, those, those, uh, those crossroads, if you will, in the life where they launch into uh, the life as a disciple of Christ. So please keep our students in your prayers this weekend as they attend the Limitless, uh, the Ignite Youth Conference. The theme is Limitless. Um, also, uh, there are a few dates that I would like you to make sure you mark down on your calendars. Uh, Saturday, October the 8th is our church conference. And this is happening uh, at our church here at Wesley Church. A couple of different churches are coming together uh, and having worship service. And then we're going to be breaking into our respective churches to do our business. And this is our annual gathering where we uh, look at the past events of what God has done at Wesley, and then to dream of what is coming next, the year ahead. And so I hope that you can join us on October 8th, Saturday, at 9.30 a.m. here at Wesley Church for our church conference. Now, sometimes when you're at church on a Saturday, you don't want to come on a Sunday, but I'm going to say you don't want to miss October the 9th because that is our confirmation Sunday. Uh, our students have gone through a year-long confirmation journey, and they're going to be confirming their baptism on October the 9th at our 1030 service. So we hope that you can join us for that service, be present to represent the, the, the body of Christ that they are entering into, they're joining, they're covenanting to be a part of. So uh, please mark your calendars. You don't want to miss it. October the 9th, Sunday, 1030 a.m. is our uh, confirmation service. Also, uh, announcement came from the men's club. Uh, the mums are here, uh, and they're in the assembly hall. If you ordered mums, please make sure to pick them up uh, downstairs at Assembly Hall before you head home. Uh, any other announcements we made this morning? All right. Uh, if not, then let's take a moment to uh, uh, pray over the offering that God has given to us. Uh, uh, you know, God is the giver of all good and perfect gifts, and we thank God for uh, his generosity, and we uh, are called to give just a portion of it back to the ministry of God's church. 
And so those of you who are faithful in God's giving, I thank you so much. Thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, those of you who are ready to give, there are three ways you can give today. You can give via envelope. Uh, you can place in the place in the back or in the front. Uh, you can also give online at wumcsp.org slash give. Or you can also give using the Tithely app. Just look up our church and you'll be able to set up reoccurring payments and uh, keep track of your giving as well. It's a great tool to use. Once again, on behalf of Wesley Church, I want to thank you for your generosity and your gifts that allows our church to continue to thrive and to be God's hands and feet to our hurting community and our world. Thank you. Well, uh, let us pray over the offering. Will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for your love and your grace, your good and perfect gifts that fill our hearts and our lives. Lord, may you anoint and bless this small gift we are giving back to you. God, is just a portion of all the good things you've given to us, but we give it back to you for the ministry of your church. Lord, may you bless it uh, with integrity and transparency that it will be used uh, with openness and with, with your uh, integrity. Lord, may you also anoint it and bless it with your multiplication. God, you multiply the five loaves and two fish to feed the thousands. So Lord, may our offering be used to feed your sheep and to further your kingdom, further your message of joy and hope with our neighbors and with the world. Use it, Lord, as you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, 
the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the father of David. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we thank you that prayer still works and that you are bringing your revival in this place. We thank you for your grace that is truly enough for us. We opened up your holy text. We read from a story written thousands of years ago. And today we seek a word from you. I am an unworthy vessel, but your word is true, so may you speak. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, I shared with you a story from my life uh, when I thought we were going to lose our daughter, Amy. Uh, she was uh, two years old. My wife, Julie, was pregnant seven months with Adam at the time. And Amy had a febrile seizure, that is a seizure brought on by uh, having a high fever. And uh, the seizure lasted for more than three hours. And when Amy finally awoke uh, several days later, the, the doctors were surprised. You know, they said, one, her being awake, and especially without any brain damage, was a miracle. She shouldn't have survived the event. And uh, even if she did, she shouldn't be able to walk and talk like she does today. Still, the road to recovery was long. I remember the day we finally got home from the hospital, about a week or so later. Uh, she had to take uh, seizure medication, which altered her mood pretty dramatically at first. And the, that day we got home, she actually bit me. Um, and that was hard. And for a long time, I still asked the question, God, why did this have to happen? God, why did this have to happen? It seemed like a hiccup in my life, like a mistake, a, a, a detour from God's plan. Like, this wasn't part of the plan. This is a bit of a mistake that just happened. Uh, it felt like a terrible, meaningless event. At first, we did not see any light at the end of the tunnel. But the teaching that we learn, that we can harvest from today's story, is that the tough times are often where we see God's grace at work. Uh, oftentimes, we don't even recognize it until much later. A New York Times bestselling uh, best author, Bob Goff, wrote in a tweet this way, Embrace uncertainty. Some of the most beautiful chapters in your lives won't have a title until much later. Right? Some of the most beautiful chapters in our lives won't have a title until much later. And sometimes we do get a glimpse of God's grace in our lives, but then the actual magnitude of that grace won't be evident for us, sometimes for years, sometimes even for generations to come. From our reading today, we learn that though our troubles now are great, God's grace that is to come is always greater. Though our troubles now are great, God's grace later is greater. Such was the case for Ruth. So uh, last week we read from chapter 1 in the book of Ruth, and there we learn of a character named Naomi. Naomi's troubles are relentless as one by one, famine and then displacement from their own home and then bereavement, steal her joy, turning her into a bitter woman. Her name, Naomi, meant pleasant. And she said, no, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitter. She became bitter. 
Eventually, she comes back to Israel many years later with her Moabite daughter-in-law, Ruth. And in chapter 2, Ruth and Naomi stick uh, together, stick uh, with each other, and Ruth uh, ekes out a, uh, a living for Naomi and herself, and both are abundantly blessed in the process. They began to actually have food to eat. And in chapter 3, Ruth, at Naomi's bidding, encounters a man named Boaz on the threshing floor. Boaz was their next of kin. We talked about last week how uh, women during this time had no means of survival if they did not have a male uh, person uh, representing them in the family, like a husband or a son. And so Boaz was their next of kin. Ruth, if she were to marry Boaz, they would be able to have salvation, literally to survive. And so uh, Naomi and Ruth uh, come, up with this, come up with this plan, and Ruth encounters Boaz. They fall in love, and, and finally we arrive in chapter 4, today's reading at the end of the book of Ruth. Let's read together verses 13, and 15, 13 through 15 again. It says this, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. So up until this point, Ruth and Naomi had everything stacked up against them. Naomi's husband and her two sons die. Ruth is also left with no husband or no men in the family to financially support her. And especially for Naomi, having Ruth, her, uh, her, uh, her daughter-in-law around, was actually more of a liability than a help for two reasons. Number one, Ruth was a Moabite. Now for those of you who don't remember some of the history we talk about in the past, Moabites were considered enemies to, Israelite, to the Israelites. They were the enemies. They were people that the Israelites learned to hate. In other words, Ruth was the wrong race. She was the wrong race, being a Moabite. And number two, she was a woman. I shared with you again, right, during this time, it was far more difficult for a woman to survive without a male kin. And so actually having another woman that she has to care for was more of a liability for Naomi. This is a, a few, uh, one of the few texts uh, in the Bible where the woman is the central characters of the story. In other words, uh, another, in other words uh, Ruth was the, the wrong gender. So here, the Moabite woman Ruth, who was the wrong race and the wrong gender, to be of any help to Naomi, begin, becomes the means of Naomi's redemption. As Robert Williamson writes in the Forgotten Books of the Bible for covering the five scrolls for today, he writes, quote, For Naomi, who has throughout the text identified security with attachment to a male, the women's words serve as a reminder that it is ultimately Ruth's commitment to her that has restored her life. This Moabite woman has given her more security than seven sons. Though Naomi's troubles were great, God's grace was greater. God's grace was greater than the racial divide between the Israelites and the Moabites. God's grace was greater than the inherent sexism in their patriarchal social norms. Though the suffering were great, God's grace was greater. But note that this grace did not come passively, but rather because Naomi and especially Ruth were faithful to doing what was right, taking agency into their own hands to do what is righteous in the eyes of God. Even though Naomi describes both the good and the bad events in her life as being from the hand of God, she says, God did this, God did this. Naomi also does not interpret her own role in securing her future to be passive. She, she doesn't exactly just let go and let God. 
Earlier in chapter 3, Naomi is the one who hatches a plan for Ruth to forge a relationship with Boaz. Like, go out and meet him. Go talk to him, right? Naomi is very intentional, saying in in verse 1 of chapter 3, my daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well for you. And she begins to make some of these plans. So how do we, as the readers, uh, see God at work here? God intersects with the characters of the book of Ruth the way that many of us today experience God. Not necessarily as a divine physical presence right in front of us, not as a booming audible voice or a lightning bolt that strikes from the sky, maybe not not often as a visible mover of of events, but rather as the one to whom we attribute some amount of agency in our own circumstances, as well as those of the world at large. For instance, in today's world, we give thanks to God after making the touchdown, or after landing that job, or when we escape from harm from an accident, right? We say, thanks thanks be to God. We understand that God's hand is at work in the goodness and the blessings that come upon us. We are perhaps less quick to attribute our calamities to God as Naomi does in, throughout this story, the good and the bad. The question of God's activity in the world is a classic and supremely difficult theological dilemma. How do we understand the relationship between human will and divine agency? Right? How much of the world is determined by God's authority and God doing things and God showing up and how much of it depends on what I do, my free will, what I choose to do and what I choose perhaps even not to do. And upon reading Ruth more intently, perhaps to draw such a line in and of itself is misguided. Perhaps there is no line but rather a permeable barrier where osmosis of wills happen freely, where it's not either or, but rather both and. Of course, where we can definitively see the hand of God is often in retrospect. Isn't that true? When the magnitude of the beauty of the final outcome is far greater than what we can possibly imagine. Just imagine with me a a, a, a painter painting a masterpiece. Now, what is she doing when she's painting? She's using all of her trained skills and all the tools in her disposal as she paints. She's putting 100% of her time and her effort towards the artwork. But then when she's done and she takes a step back and the masterpiece does something to her soul, it impacts her far greater than what she could have possibly imagined. She experienced what she could only describe as the beauty of God. Was this painting created by human will or divine agency? Perhaps the right answer is yes. Yes. And we see this beautiful canvas of the magnitude of God's unfolding grace In verse 17, let's read this together. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. So first, in the immediate story, we see Naomi's life move from bitterness, Mara, back to pleasantness. Naomi, the meaning of her name. Ruth has found security and is now settled in a new home. The empty wombs of the two widows are now full in the child Obed, whom, whom Ruth bears and whom the women of the village set in Naomi's arms and say, a son has been born to Naomi. A happy ending. But... Then we see the implications uh, to the series of events that go far beyond Ruth and Naomi's comprehension, but something that we, as the audience of several millennia later, can appreciate. 
The, the foreigner woman, Ruth, becomes the ancestor to King David, the greatest king of Israel, in line, in, in the line that also leads to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the universe. While Naomi suffered, she truly did the loss of her husband and her two sons, as well as the, the security and, and meaning that family structure carried with it in her society. Through God's work in unexpected ways and unexpected relationships, but also with Naomi and Ruth's human will to stay together, to stay faithful to one another, and to honor God actively, Naomi found, true, found new joy and meaning in her relationship with Ruth and Ruth's family. And God takes the suffering and builds it into his narrative of redemption for the entire world. Do you see this? Though our sufferings now are great, God's grace that is coming later is far greater than we can possibly imagine or comprehend. I was humbled and blessed that Amy got to live that day almost five years ago. I don't know what would have happened or what I would have done if she did not come back. But one thing did happen from that experience. You know, at that time, I was a full-time video producer. I was making videos, I was still running my own company, doing what I love to do. Before that, I had been called to ministry and I was a pastor for a couple of years, but I quit. And I was doing this video thing all, by my, all on my own. But God had been tugging on my heart. James, it's time to come back to pastor the church. But I ignored it, and I ignored it, and I ignored it. I was running away from it like Jonah, going the opposite direction from where God was calling me to. Something happened to me on that day we got back from the hospital. It was as if I could no longer disobey God. I recognized deeply my own mortality and just the fragility of everything that I have that God truly gives and takes away. And I came to see the need in my life to just surrender everything to God and to actively obey where God is leading me. So that evening, I got on my knees and I prayed, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And so after my prayer that night, I spoke with my wife about where I felt God was calling me. And then I called up my uh, district superintendent at the time, Drew Dyson, and I told him, hey, Drew, um, listen, I know this is like completely out of the blue, but I feel like God is leading me in this direction. Uh, so if you're looking for a pastor for a church, like I, I, might, I'm, I might be available. <laughs> And, and I said, but if there's not, don't worry about it. You know, if you don't have a church for me, I'm happy. No, don't worry about it. And uh, Drew said, actually, there is a church. Uh, there's, a, there's a small church uh, with a few congregants. They just need a part-time preacher, someone to just come in on Sundays and to, to preach and to just remind them that God loves them. You can still keep your job and just do it on the side uh, on Sundays. I said, all right. One thing led to another. I, start, I did that. And a year passed. And now God's nudge on my heart grew stronger. I said, all right, James, it's time to go all in. And so this time I, I, I was a little more ready to obey. I said, okay, where is this going? And I spoke with uh, some uh, pastors and uh, the district superintendent, uh, Drew Dyson, again about where I felt my heart was going. And an idea came up about planting a new church. I said, okay, James. Uh, this sounds great. Let's have, all these people begin to strategize about a church plant that might be able to happen. I said, James, we're going to get you into this church plant. It's going to be great. It's going to be a lot of fun. I said, cool. I was in my late 20s. I was like, yeah, this is going to be fun. Uh, and we had talked about it on a Sunday. And then on Monday night, I get a call from Drew. And he says, so James, uh, there's this church called Wesley in South Plainfield. And I said, where's that? 
And uh, it was not what I had planned. It was not what I was thinking. And so my wife and I, Julie and I, prayed again. I remember us praying, because this wasn't what we were thinking. And we said, not my will, but your will be done. And so we said yes. And one thing led to another. And here we are four years later. And pastoring Wesley Church has been my greatest life honor that I could be your pastor. To me, to obey God's will and not to wait just passively, but actually actively participating in that will, that is where I eventually found the light at the end of the tunnel. I will not say God caused Amy to have that seizure. So I'm a little different from Naomi in that. But I do believe that God used that to wake me up, to allow me to walk this path of obedience, active obedience, and aligning myself with God's will. Not my will, but your will be done. Though our suffering is great, God's grace is far greater. Though our suffering then was great, God's grace that I'm experiencing now is far greater. Beloved, in moments when you think you're out of reach, beyond any point of refuge, God's grace can still reach you. God's grace can still reach all of us. And so we, have to, we are invited to ask ourselves today, how are you seeing God's grace, God's work in your life? How can you reframe your focus on the dark places instead to begin to see God's light that is shining on your life? And you are not meant to walk this thing called life alone. Naomi had her root. And so this week, church, I want to invite you to just do two things in the name of celebrating God's grace in our lives. Number one, think about someone who has journeyed with you in a difficult time and to reach out to them, to thank them for being the light uh, in your dark tunnels, right? Thank them for being... Uh, a Ruth in your life, showing your gratitude for God's grace working through them in your difficult times. And then number two, consider who is God calling you to be a Ruth to? And allow God's amazing grace that transcends uh, uh, the generations to flow through the life chapter you're living here and now. Remember, church, Though our sufferings are great, God's grace is greater. And so let us celebrate God's grace together. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and living God, I thank you for gathering today and the reading of your word. Lord, we thank you for the promise of redemption and resurrection and your grace that is enough and will meet us and see us through. Lord, many of us are, are, are suffering today. Many of us are struggling today. Many of us are uncertain about our future today. Many of us are anxious today. Lord, our suffering is great, but your grace to come is greater. You are the great promise keeper, and so, Lord, we lean on that promise. We lean on your faithfulness, knowing that you are the God of grace. You are the God of glory, and so we lean on you. We trust in you. Lead us now to walk with Ruths, to be the Ruth for someone as we celebrate your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing.
and now receive the blessing, go forth, children of the Most High God, recipients of the greatest love this world has ever known, knowing that though the suffering and the uncertainty and the anxieties that you're going through right now are great, God's grace that is to come is far greater, and that we can look forward to the activities and the promises of God's fulfilled fulfillment. So go forth, sharing that good news of God's never-ending grace with our neighbors and with the world. In the name of the one who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen.